In this tutorial, we're going to be talking about fine art black and white processing using two architecture images as examples and touching on Nick Silver FX in the process. Hi there, Michael Volshinovich here. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash vibrantshot. Uh, so today we're going to be taking a look at processing architecture images in a fine art sort of black and white style. And um, I find that this style seems to be quite popular these days and uh, really it's characterized by, you know, uh, strong contrast and uh, using things like long exposures and essentially emphasizing, you know, certain shapes and forms uh, and kind of de-emphasizing other things. So oftentimes it's a fairly minimalist style as well. And uh, we're going to look at two images that I shot in Chicago and uh, I'm going to take you through them, uh, not necessarily from scratch because that would just take way too long. Uh, we're going to kind of look at some of the layers that I've created so that you can replicate the same general workflow. And uh, with this one here, we're just going to kind of talk about it from the black and white standpoint from Silver FX onwards. And then with this one over here, we're going to touch on uh, Silver FX, or I should say Nick Silver FX, in a little bit more detail. So we're going to start with the color version and we're going to kind of build up to, uh, to this black and white version over here. So with this image, uh, essentially we have, um, you know, if I, if I kind of toggle back to the original image over here, then um, as you can see the image is not bad but it's a little bit flat uh, it kind of just doesn't really emphasize any one particular thing it's just kind of a mishmash of, of shapes and so um, I did see a bit of potential in this image in these these lines that we have over here they're pretty interesting and then we've got some you know kind of opposite um, angles and shapes kind of going through here uh, and there's a nice bit of contrast between the windows and you know some of these lighter portions of the building so um, essentially as you can see if we kind of toggle back to the final version uh, I have essentially played up some of those uh, those lines, you know, really increasing the contrast and, and making a much more interesting image, I think. So um, basically where we started off with, uh, and again, I'm going to cover uh, Silver FX in a little bit more detail uh, in the next image. So you can kind of just imagine that I've essentially run my color image through uh, Silver FX to get to this point. Now before that, I also did some uh, perspective adjustments inside of Lightroom. So essentially I just did some, um, you know, vertical keystone correction, some distortion correction just to get the verticals nice and straight and get everything uh, kind of cropped the way I wanted to. So with that done, uh, we've got our black and white in place and then we're going to start building up from there. So the next thing I did was add this layer over here, which essentially just punches up some of these whites that we have over here on uh, the left hand side of our image. And to do that, basically I use a technique that uh, you probably would have seen many, many times before in uh, some of my tutorials. Essentially I go into the channels, I selected a channel that uh, that really with a black and white it doesn't matter which channel you select, so I just picked one at random. Uh, and I created this layer over here, so essentially I duplicated the channel, did a levels adjustment to bring out just the lights, and then based on that I can command select that, I can go back into my layers, create a blank, uh, blank layer, fill the selection with white, and we get essentially this layer over here. So um, you can't really see that uh, too well here, but there's basically some white lines uh, within there. So let me just actually, I'm going to create a new layer here, fill that with black, and why are we not seeing that? Okay, well, forget that approach. Uh, just trust me that there is actually uh, white lines in there, and you can kind of faintly see that there. So uh, essentially, I did apply a layer mask to that, so it really only applies onto this side, because otherwise, you know, you see what you get over here. It's not what we want at all. I just wanted to emphasize these little white areas over here. Then the next thing is I added a curves adjustment and that curves adjustment basically lowers the exposure on the right hand side because I thought that again that was drawing the eye a little too much. We want to emphasize really this side a little bit more than this side. So that curves adjustment just uh, nothing too fancy. Basically I'm just bringing uh, some of the midtones down and not trying not to affect the, um, the actual highlights too much. And again that's of course layer mask just using a gradient fill uh, to make sure that it affects only this side. Next thing is uh, this layer mask is a little bit more complicated. Essentially, as you can see, what it does is it brings out those lines uh, and uh, highlights a little bit more. And basically, if we look at that layer mask, we see that this layer mask looks something like this. And so um, and another reason why I'm not starting this from scratch is because to uh, create these selections did take a little bit of uh, a little bit of time. I just used the pen tool and I made selections around these uh, lines over here so that I could bring them out a lot more within this curves adjustment. So as we can see, that curves adjustment primarily affects those lines. 
And then finally, we have another curves adjustment over here, which, um, as we can see, it um, brings everything uh, down in exposure, particularly uh, the midtones. But again, that affects only sort of the opposite thing. So it doesn't affect some of these white lines that we have. It doesn't affect these um, these angled lines as well. It really just focuses on um, everything that's that's largely black. And so I really did that just by kind of almost creating an inverse of this uh, this particular layer mask over here uh, with some additional adjustments. So that's basically. Uh, what I did to create this image. So overall, it's it's pretty straightforward. Really, all we have is um, three curves adjustments and a, uh, and a fill, white fill layer, essentially, uh, that was created, again, just using a channels-based selection. So that's that image there. And we're going to move on to the second image, where we essentially started with this color photo over here. As you can see, it's not terribly exciting, and so obviously I wanted to make it much more interesting. So starting off with the color image, uh, basically I the first thing I wanted to do was make the sky a little bit more interesting because in its current state it's obviously not terribly interesting. What I really liked about the uh, image itself was this kind of highlight that we have going on in the building uh, and this, you know, like gradation of color and also the vertical lines that we see is a nice mix of shadow and highlight here. So that part I did like, but unfortunately we had a clear sky essentially that day and it's just not terribly interesting. So um, rather than kind of make a completely dead section of image here, I decided to add some uh, interesting sky effects. So to do that, basically I had um, some long exposure skies shot. And so if we go into the sky section over here and we enable that, um, essentially it just creates something like this. And I did that just through uh, several pieces that essentially are these blurred skies. So uh, I took my sky that I'd shot and I cut out a couple of different sections of it. I applied it, rotated, used um, the transform tool to kind of get it into place where I thought it would look good. I did use some blend if, some layer blend if here. So as you can see, I didn't want to bring in uh, too much of the darker portions. I really just wanted the, the brighter highlights. So that's why um, you see I'm kind of blending this area. In. And I pretty much did that on every one of these little individual pieces. So with those pieces, the next thing I did was I just adjusted um, the brightness of them with the curves adjustment. So that's uh, basically I've just brightened them up a lot because as you can see, the original ones were gray and that's really not what I wanted. I wanted uh, white clouds. So I just brightened that up a whole lot and I I made that as a clipping mask. So it's a clipping mask for these uh, for all these different parts here and it shouldn't affect the rest of the image. So with our sky in place, the next thing I had to do was to sort of isolate the building on its own. And so to do that, I just uh, essentially used the polygonal lasso tool and just kind of created a selection around this, uh, given obviously that this is a fairly straightforward selection. It took no time at all just to use that. Uh, obviously, with a more complex selection, you may have to use a pen tool and uh, spend a lot more time on it. But in this case, it was very simple. So if we turn on the building itself, we'll just bring back our sky here. Now, as we can see, the building has been put over top of the sky. So whereas before uh, the sky was covering things, uh, now we actually have it over top. And uh, I did make some curves adjustments over here. As you can see, the building itself is a lot darker. So um, in between here, unfortunately, I don't have the layers uh, on me, but I did uh, essentially darken the building itself because I thought it was just a little bit too bright in its uh, current state. So that's really all that was done in the middle there. And I did actually uh, brighten out the Conrad sign because I did want to make that pop a little bit more. So that again was just uh, doing a selection through here and just brightening it up using a curves adjustment. So that's just that layer is there essentially on its own. So now moving on to the next thing. Originally I was kind of thinking that I may want to keep this in color so I made some color adjustments and overall you know I kind of like the color that we had but I just felt that it wasn't an interesting enough image in color so I decided to move forward with a black and white process on that. So the next thing we're going to look at is the dodge and burn. Uh, now, essentially these color adjustments, I'm not going to cover these too much because that's not really the subject of discussion for this particular video. We do have a separate video on adjusting colors. So I pretty much used all the same things that, uh, that you've already seen in there. In terms of dodge and burn, I just used our curves dodge and burn method that we again discuss in the dodge and burn video that we have. And so for that, um, I basically created a whole series of levels adjustments here and each of those masks out certain areas. So if we just enable our dodge and burn here, we see that I've essentially just masked in some of these verticals very carefully uh, and just really, you know, highlighted the areas that I think uh, deserve the most attention. And so I did like those verticals from the start. So that's why I decided to sort of brighten the lighter ones, darken the darker ones to really kind of give it a little bit more of a three-dimensional texture. 
And then with that done, the next thing I did was essentially created a um, stamp visible layer out of what we had there. So if we just hit Command Option Shift E, that's going to create our stamp visible layer for all of this stuff down here. And then we can actually move into Nick Silver FX. So we're going to go into Filter Nick Collection Silver FX Pro 2. And so with uh, with Nick, generally I I do have a couple of presets, but for the most part I just start with the neutral option. You can kind of go through some of the different uh, ones that they have in here, and uh, you know some of these low key ones are often pretty good for uh, doing these sort of fine art processes. But for the most part, and sometimes these ones too, like the full dynamic, full spectrum, those are, are actually not bad starting points sometimes as well. But for the most part, I just start with the neutral one, and I just kind of adjust to taste, if you will. And what I do tend to do is I tend to process the same image, um, you know, two to four times, depending on how I find that Nick affects different areas. Because you can use control points within Nick, but I find that it's just, I get more control by just applying layer masks within Photoshop. So I'll go in here four times and make adjustments for the certain area that I actually want to apply, and then I'll layer mask that out. So in the case of this particular image, I actually made one adjustment uh, for most of the building. I did another adjustment for this portion of the building, and then I did another adjustment for the sky itself. So if we go into here, um, the, the interface is really straightforward in Nick. Essentially here we're just, you know, controlling brightness in the highlights, midtones, shadows, so no real surprises there. You know, if we brighten that, it, it brightens the midtones. If we, or I should say highlights, if we uh, slide this, obviously it brightens the midtones. Uh, really basic stuff. Now dynamic brightness basically just brightens the entire image overall, so you can think of that almost like a exposure adjustment inside of Lightroom. Contrast, as you would expect, obviously adds um, contrast to the image, so again, no surprise there. One thing I wish that they did was that if you can you double click on things, it will reset them, but um, that doesn't seem to work uh, like it does inside of Lightroom. So just so you know, you have to adjust the sliders if you want to kind of get back down, or just click on the number to get back to zero if you ever want to. Now in here, uh, basically this just kind of pump, pumps up the whites, which again is um, is nice to do in fine art. Obviously, um, you don't really tend to use the whites too much in fine art. I find the blacks is something that you tend to use a lot more often. So this is definitely a slider you're going to want to experiment a little bit with. Soft contrast is kind of an interesting effect. Essentially, it just uh, determines the sharpness of how that contrast is applied. And as you can see, um, when you kind of slide it, you can almost see the application of this within fine art. Like this particular highlight that we had in this gradation is really nicely affected by it. But obviously, it completely destroys all of this stuff here. And we don't really want to lose all that detail. And we don't want to wash out our sky. So this is, again, another reason why I tend to um, you know, process the image two or three times and then mask that out. Essentially what I would do is maybe I like something like this for this portion, so I'll apply that, then I'll create a selection again using the polygonal lasso tool and just kind of cut that piece out and then process the rest of the image separately and just kind of merge them all together. So that's something you can definitely do. Structure you can kind of think of as uh, similar to clarity inside of Lightroom. So basically, if we kind of pump this up, we see that it really, you know, brings up the dynamic clarity image, and obviously the sky ends up looking terrible here. But again, you know, in some areas it does look good. It looks pretty nice through here. Um, some of this looks okay. You know, you may like it on these verticals, but obviously it you know kind of destroys your sky. So again, for that reason, we process separately and we cut that piece out um, and sort of blend together without the structure for the sky, for example. So again, bringing that down. Now, um, all of these different sliders here essentially just kind of dictate, you know, what the structure is like in the highlights, midtones, shadows. So there's really no surprise there. Fine structure, I don't tend to use too much. It's uh, it doesn't really do too much. It's just more of a, a very subtle kind of structure within the finer details of the image. So that I pretty much leave alone. Tonality protection really is just again what it what it says. Um, so you know if we really kind of crank some of these values here, how much of the original tonality do you want to bring through to the image? How, how much of it do you want to preserve? Uh, and again, sometimes um, I'll usually kind of bring these up to around like a 20% uh, area, so we don't completely uh, destroy the original sort of value of our image. Control points you can essentially add, and they sort of target a specific tonal range, and you can, um, you know, enlarge the size of your control point and how it affects the image. Again, I don't really tend to use them too much. They're really useful if you're processing only in Lightroom, but if you are working in Photoshop, I find it's always just easiest to work with layer masks within Photoshop. So again, I'll just process the image three or four times separately and layer mask in the parts that I'm interested in. The um, color filters here essentially 
Uh, I don't tend to use these too much. They apply essentially as a color cast to the image. Um, grain I'll sometimes use, but generally I apply grain before I'm exporting an image because uh, obviously if I apply grain at this size, which is, you know, 36 megapixels, um, and uh, then I export it at, you know, 900 pixels by 900 pixels for web use, uh, that grain will essentially disappear. So I don't really apply grain until uh, I export the image. And then sensitivity, I tend to leave these alone with architecture images um, because they don't really have that much of an effect. Uh, sometimes I'll play with the blues depending on how I want to affect the sky, but basically they just kind of dictate, uh, you know, just like with the black and white uh, adjustment layer that you have within Photoshop itself, um, just how uh, dark the blues will be and so on. But uh, again, you know, as you can see, the effect is really subtle. So for the most part, we just kind of use the top uh, adjustments to achieve some of these values here and as well as layer masks. Where I do find it's really useful, the red and yellows um, are really nice when you're editing portraits because obviously skin tones are going to be predominantly red and yellow. And so if you use those, you can really adjust how the skin uh, tonality looks within your image. And that does make a pretty drastic difference. So it does become useful there. Levels and curves, again, I don't really use this. I just adjust my levels and curves right through um, Photoshop. And then toning, finally, you can just apply um, a color cast within your uh, blacks, for example. So if we want to add a bit of a blue tone to it, we can do that through here. And then also within the whites, we can apply maybe, let's say we want a yellow tone within the white. So that's basically the paper hue. As you can see, it will give you something like that. So in this case, we're not going to do that. We're going to stick with just straight black and white. So now I'm not going to um, actually use this version of the image because, I, again, I did mask out a couple of different variations to sort of create my final image. So we're just going to cancel that. I just wanted to take you through um, a quick preview of SilverFX just to give you an idea of how it works. So I'm just going to go back and delete this, and we're going to go to our uh, image that came out of SilverFX. So basically, this is the image we got out of SilverFX. Now, for the most part, I was pretty happy with it. What I didn't like, though, was the way the sky looks a little bit blotchy over here. So to fix that, all I did was um, I did have my sky essentially isolated over here. And we did have um, within here, we've got our selection. Essentially, if we just hit command on that, as we can see, it'll just bring back my selection. So I isolated my sky and then I just applied um, a motion blur essentially to the sky just to kind of get rid of some of that patchiness. And so to You'll see what that looks like. Essentially, it has just nicely smoothed out those uh, those textures for us. Next thing I had to do was to mask out again, just the um, because if we kind of look at this, we toggle it on. You see that that motion blur did soften the edges over here. So we just want to make sure we bring the building right back. And I did apply uh, a ton of extra contrast to this. So I did an additional silver FX um, processing just for the building. So I brought that back up over top of it. Then um, this is essentially just a blend of the two, so this makes no difference, this layer over here. Finally, uh, this was another silver FX adjustment that I just brought in to this top portion. So that again was just that, uh, use that uh, soft contrast adjustment that we saw there to really bring this, uh, make it a little bit brighter. Then I did a, an overall curves adjustment to that just to kind of darken the whole image. So no real uh, surprise there, just lowered the overall uh, brightness of our image. And I just did one final little curves adjustment with a circular gradient over here to bring in a little bit of a highlight. So essentially we've gone from this fairly flat looking color image to something that's a lot more interesting in black and white. So I think that that whole edit probably took me uh, maybe 40 minutes to do. So it's not a terribly uh, difficult thing to do and it's not terribly time consuming to get to this point. So I hope that that uh, gives you at least a good starting point into how to make these um, these fine art images. The best thing to do is just to kind of scour the internet and find what style works for you and just kind of experiment with the tools um, that you see here. Largely, again, it's just curves adjustments and uh, I do really recommend Silver FX as a good tool for creating your black and white. It just gets you there a little bit faster and uh, I find it does produce a really nice result. So until next time, uh, be sure to subscribe to our Facebook page. Uh, if you go facebook.com slash vibrantshot, just like us on there to make sure you don't miss any updates and also to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.